All right then. So this is the third part of lesson three. Uh, we will talk about osmoregulation. We have already talked about the structure and function of kidney. We have talked about the function of nephron. And now we are talking about osmoregulation, where we'll talk about negative feedback. We will talk about the role of hypothalamus, posterior pituitary gland, and antidiuretic hormone in co coordinating osmoregulation. And definitely we'll talk about the basic definition of osmoregulation. Okay, so negative feedback is your body mechanism to restore any deviations from normal and it brings it back, back to its original state, right? So as you're talking about osmoregulation, we'll be talking about mechanisms of the body to restore the blood water potential back to normal. Okay, so let's talk about why is homeostasis of water potential of blood or osmoregulation is important. For that, it's better that you think about the process of osmosis. So we have two conditions. Uh, we, have, we can have a condition in which blood would have a very low water potential. It means the blood is hypertonic, so we have more solutes. And we have another condition where blood has too high a water potential. It means it's hypotonic. So the concentration of water as compared to solutes is more. Okay, now in the first condition, what would happen? Think about there's a cell and then in the blood outside, the concentration of solutes is more as compared to water particles, right? So in such a state, blood is actually hypertonic at this moment. So what will happen as water flows from a high water potential to a low water potential gradient? So what will happen? Too much water will leave the cells, right? And it will move into the blood by osmosis. What will happen to the cells in this case, cells will actually shrivel. Their size will be, become small and the process is known as prenation, right? So if too much water leaves the cell, this will happen. In the second situation, when the blood is, hyper, uh, is hypotonic actually, right? So we have more water as compared to solutes. So what will happen in this case, too much water will actually move from the blood into the cells. Right, because again, of the same reason, because water flows uh, from a region of high water potential to a region of low water potential. And what will happen to the cells because of that? Cells will actually swell when they would actually burst because of that, right? So hypotonic, in a hypotonic situation, okay, um, the water will move from the blood into the cells. And in hypertonic situation, the water will move from the cells into the blood. Okay then, so what actually causes the blood to become hypertonic, um, too much sweating? Yes, a lot of water leaving the body, not drinking enough water, and lots of ions in the diet, like lots of salt. So th these are the conditions that can actually make the blood go hypertonic. So the corrective mechanism for this is that more water is reabsorbed by osmosis into the blood because right now the condition is that solutes are more as compared to water. Right, so more water will be reabsorbed by osmosis into the blood from the tubules into the nephrons, right? Tubules of the nephrons. This means that then urine will be actually more concentrated this time because you want to conserve water and less water is lost in the urine, right? So this is a corrective mechanism in a situation when the blood becomes hypotonic. However, when the blood becomes hypotonic, right? So the conditions uh, associated with that are drinking too much water or maybe the person is not having enough salt in the diet the corrective mechanism of the body would be less water is reabsorbed by osmosis, right? Because we want the body to actually uh, remove water, like that, that, get rid of the water, right? So it would actually leave the blood from the tubules of the nephrons again. And this means the urine this time will be more dilute as more water is lost in the urine. Okay then, so what is the role of hypothalamus and posterior pituitary gland in osmoregulation? So changes in the water potential of the blood are detected by osmoreceptors, which are found in the hypothalamus. So again, uh, osmoreceptors, which are found in the hypothalamus, right? Now related to the previous example of the cell that we had just shared, if the water potential of the blood is too low, right? So we know that there's actually water would leave the cells. So the same would happen with the osmoreceptors, 
right? Water would leave the osmoreceptors by osmosis and the osmoreceptors are present here in the hypothalamus, right? So what would happen to the osmoreceptors? They will actually shrivel. Their size will become decreased. This will actually be detected by the hypothalamus and this will stimulate it to release a hormone which is known as antidiuretic hormone. So I hope you're getting it. So what happens as the water potential of the blood is too low, the size of the osmoreceptors here in the hypothalamus will decrease because of the reason that water leaves these osmoreceptors by osmosis, right? And this will stimulate the hypothalamus to secrete, produce more of antidiuretic hormone, right? Alternatively, if the water potential of the blood is too high, so again, what will happen? Water will enter the osmoreceptors by osmosis and these osmoreceptors here will actually swell. Their size will increase. This again will be detected by the hypothalamus and this time on they are going to produce less antidiuretic hormone, right? So hypothalamus is actually the place where this antidiuretic hormone is produced, right? But then this hormone moves to the posterior pituitary gland, right? And then this posterior pituitary gland actually releases antidiuretic hormone into the capillaries and then it goes into the blood and then it goes to the final target organ, which is actually the kidney, right? So I, ho I hope you get the idea that what's happening here, that uh, how hypothalamus and posterior pituitary gland are related in maintaining osmoregulation. Okay, then as this antidiuretic hormone, it reaches the kidney, uh, it actually has its specific receptors there. So it uh, causes an increase in the permeability of the walls of the collecting the and the distal convoluted tubule. Okay, so it causes an increase in the permeability of the walls of the collecting duct and the distal convoluted tubule. So these are the structures where it acts, right? So because of increasing permeability, right, it causes more water to leave the nephron, right? And it is then reabsorbed into the blood. So this time on the urine will be more concentrated. So that's why the name antidiuretic, right? It will make the urine concentrated, it will help in reabsorbing the water. So these are the two structures where it acts. Distal convoluted tubule. So it has receptors here and it has receptors here in the collecting duct. Okay, so as we know that antidiuretic hormone must have as a specific receptors. So the receptors are aquaporins. Aqua stands for water. So these receptors are actually found on the cell. So here you, you can see a cell which is there in the collecting tubule right now. So this is blood in which the hormone is actually uh, going to be present, right? So this part of the cell is actually the basal part, which is facing the endothelium. And this part here, apical side is the one which is actually facing the lumen. So this cell has two sides, right? So this is aquaporin, the receptors which are attached to the basal end of the cell. And as the hormone is traveling in the blood, this hormone will actually attach to this receptor here, right? So antidiuretic hormone, will bind to this receptor, aquaporin. Now, when it binds to it, it activates a phosphorylase enzyme in the cells, right? So uh, we'll talk about the whole process here. So it activates this enzyme and the phosphorylase actually causes these vesicles which are inside the cell already. And these vesicles also have aquaporins in them, right? So we have aquaporin receptors which are attached there at the surface. And we have vesicles also inside the cell which contain aquaporin. Okay, so what happens after this phosphorylase, uh, uh, this whole reaction, these aquaporins, these vesicles containing aquaporins, they would actually go and fuse with the side of the membrane, the apical side of the membrane, right? The one which is facing the lumen. And now these, uh, these water channels, these aquaporins, they actually they are now attached to the surface here. So what will they do? They will actually increase the permeability. So now these water channels are here. And through these water channels, water will actually diffuse into the cell. Got it? So because of this whole process, water will leave the lumen of the distal convoluted tubule or the collecting duct and it, they will actually enter the blood. So this is how water will be conserved through antidiuretic hormone and the, water, and the urine this time will be concentrated. Okay then, so antidiuretic hormone, it binds to the receptors in the plasma membrane of these epithelial cells, the epithelial cells of distal convoluted tubule as well as the collecting duct. So what happens, this stimulates the production of cyclic AMP, which acts as a second messenger. Cyclic AMP then activates the enzyme protein kinase. This becomes activated, which phosphorylates proteins and then causes the vesicles to fuse with the plasma membrane. 
as we just saw in this diagram here, right? It causes this vesicle to fuse with the plasma membrane, right? So that aquaporin channel can be inserted into the plasma membrane as we have just seen in this diagram here. See? So this is what happens. Okay. So this is just a review of how to uh, bring this normal water potential of blood. So let's start from here. Let's see the water potential of the blood. If it increases, it means we are talking about too much water. This will be detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus, right? And this hypothalamus will then release less antidiuretic hormone, right? Because we do not want to conserve water this time. This is, water is already too much. What will happen now? Since there is less antidiuretic hormone, now the, the distal convective tubule as well as the collecting duct, they will become less permeable to water, right? So they will not allow reabsorption of water, right? And this will cause more water to be lost in the urine. So this time the urine will be a dilute one, right? So if the water potential is more, hypothalamus releases less antidiuretic hormone, right? Which makes the distal convective tubule and the collecting duct less permeable to water. And in turn, we have a dilute urea, right? Okay. But if the water potential of blood it decreases, not enough water, right? So what happens? This again is actually detected by the osmoreceptors, but now the hypothalamus will release antidiuretic hormone, right? Which will be then released by the posterior pituitary gland into the blood. And this will cause the distal convective tubule and the collecting duct uh, walls to become more permeable to water, right? Because they will attach to the aquaporins and the whole series of um, enzyme cascade will begin. And this will cause more water to be absorbed into the blood, right? And less will be lost in the urine. So this time, a small volumes of concentrated urine will be produced. So this is another comparative diagram. So if there are low levels of antidiuretic hormone, so you will have large volumes of dilute urine present because this water will not be reabsorbed, right? And the collecting duct wall will actually become impermeable because now there is no antidiuretic hormone to actually attach and bind to the aquaporins, right? So dilute urine will be formed. But if the concentration of antidiuretic hormone is higher, so this will increase the permeability of collecting ducts as well as the distal quantity tubules right, to water and water will actually leave the collecting duct and it will be reabsorbed into the plasma. So this time, a small volumes of concentrated urine will be formed. Okay, so just to summarize the process, this is blood which contains antidiuretic hormone as hormone travels in the blood. So this uh, blood, this is this antidiuretic hormone actually will go and attach to these receptors, which are aquaporins, right? And uh, this will activate a series of enzyme control reactions, which will actually um, end with this uh, active phosphorylase enzyme. And phosphorylase enzyme, this causes these vesicles which contain aquaporin, right? So these are actually membrane bound channels, right? So these actually will go and bind to the cell surface membrane along the luminal side. So here you can see they fuse with the membrane. Now we have water channels here and through which water can move freely from the lumen into the cell and through the cell, it can easily pass into the plasma. Now, in cases the necessary amount of antidiuretic hormone is not secreted, more amount of water gets removed from the body by urine, right? So this causes actually dehydration and a condition actually results which is known as diabetes insipidus, right? So this causes more water to be lost from the body. So finally, just to summarize, negative feedback is the restoration of systems to the original level. For example, we were discussing right now about the water potential of the blood. Then osmoregulation is an example of homeostasis. It is a control of water potential of the blood. And then hypothalamus, the posterior pituitary gland, antidiuretic hormone, they all work together to coordinate in osmoregulation. Okay, uh, so we'll, uh, we'll watch a small video related to it, and then we'll wind up. Thank you. The most important renal action of antidiuretic hormone or ADH is to increase the water permeability of the collecting duct epithelia of nephron and thus controlling the degree of dilution or concentration of the urine.
when the body needs to conserve water in circumstances such as dehydration adh is secreted in the circulation ADH binds to its specific V2 receptor in the basolateral membrane of the collecting duct epithelial cells. This in turn increases the formation of second messenger cyclic AMP. CAMP activates the protein kinase A by phosphorylation. Activated protein kinase A stimulates the movement of storage vesicles along with the intracellular protein named aquaporin 2 or AQP2 to the luminal side of the cell membranes. These molecules of aquaporin 2 fuse with the cell membrane by exocytosis to form water channels that permit rapid diffusion of water through the cells. Other aquaporins named aquaporin 3 and aquaporin 4 on the basolateral side of the cell membrane provide a path for water to rapidly exit the cell, although these are not believed to be regulated by ADH. When the concentration of ADH decreases, the molecules of aquaporin 2 are shuttled back to the cell cytoplasm and thereby the water channels are removed from the luminal membrane.